In this question, we are given that the complex number 1 minus 2i is a root of this cubic equation. Now notice that the coefficients are all real numbers. When that happens, we saw before that the conjugate of 1 minus 2i is another root of this cubic equation. The conjugate of 1 minus 2i written z1 bar is 1 plus 2i. So we have two roots found. Now in general, a cubic equation has at most three distinct roots. So if there's a third root and we want to find it, we can use the factor theorem. As a reminder, the factor theorem says that a polynomial f of z, in this case our f of z is a cubic, has a factor z minus k if and only if f of k is zero. So in this example our polynomial is a cubic polynomial. So here is our f of z. Okay, we're trying to solve the equation f of z equals zero. So for example, we are given that f of one minus two i is equal to zero. That's a given. If we plug one minus two i in for z, evaluate all of this, we get zero. So that's our k. So we use the factor theorem, tells us that if f of k is 0, then z minus k is a factor. So z minus this thing here, k is 1 minus 2i, is a factor. So we have to subtract 1 minus 2i. Well, that gives us minus 1 plus 2i. So this is a factor of f of z. Now we have a second root of our cubic equation, that's 1 plus 2i, so if we use the factor theorem, we see that if this is our k, then z minus k is a factor. So we want z minus 1 plus 2i, that's z minus 1 minus 2i, so that's a second factor of f of z. So we found two linear factors of our cubic equation. Um, if we multiply two linear factors together, we get the quadratic factor, where the highest power of z is 2. In order to get the cubic equation, of course, we have to multiply this quadratic factor by another linear factor, where the highest power of z is 1. Here is a general linear expression in z. We have some number a multiplied by z, plus some other number b, so a and b are fixed numbers that we need to determine. Of course, to find this linear factor, we have to divide our cubic by this quadratic factor. Okay, let's get the quadratic factor. So we have to multiply these two expressions. Now, you can see clearly that these two expressions have the form z minus a number. I won't use the letter a because it's used over here. So it's got the form z minus c. And this expression here is the form z minus d. c is a constant. It's a fixed number. It happens to be a complex number, but that doesn't matter. Um, you know, if we multiply z minus c by z minus d, you get z squared minus z times the sum c plus d plus the product of c and d. So that's quite simple to, to show, and we've seen this kind of thing before. Um, but what is c? Well, if we go back here, c is 1 minus 2i, one of the roots of the polynomial, and d is 1 plus 2i, the other root of the polynomial. So now we can quickly write down what the result is. Um, we have z squared minus z times the sum of these two roots, that's 1 minus 2i plus 1 plus 2i, that gives us 2, plus the product of the roots, so we have to multiply 1 minus 2i by 1 plus 2i. If you multiply a complex number by its conjugate, you get the square of the magnitude, that's got by squaring the real part and squaring the imaginary part. So we've seen that before. So that gives us 5. Okay, so now let's get a, z, plus b. Let's get this linear factor. We have to take f of z, the cubic, and divide by this quadratic, z squared minus 2z plus 5. Okay, so all of this is the cubic, so we have to do long division. So we know what to do. We take z squared and divide it into 2z cubed to get 2z. 
after dividing we multiply 2z by all of this quadratic so we get back to 2z cubed we get minus 4z squared plus 10z the next step is to subtract so we take this expression here and subtract this one so these cancel minus 7 minus minus 4 is minus 3 and 16 minus 10 is 6 after subtraction the next step is to take down this term and now we go back to the division step so this time we divide z squared into minus 3z squared to get minus 3 after dividing we multiply minus 3 by all of this and you see that um, we get this here when we subtract we get 0 and that's our remainder we expect of course to get a remainder of 0 because we know that the quadratic is a factor of the cubic so az plus b is equal to 2z minus 3 so that tells us that a must be 2 and b must be minus 3 now that we have this factor we can get the third root of this equation by setting this factor equal to 0 see we have a product of factors giving us 0 so the only way to get 0 is if one of them is 0 so we've already seen if this first one is 0 we get the roots 1 minus 2y and 1 plus 2y so if we put the second one equal to 0 um, the whole thing is going to be 0 and that happens when z is equal to 3 over 2 so now we have all three roots are solutions of the cubic equation I said earlier that if we have three roots and two of them are complex roots well the third one has to be a real root that's because for a cubic equation with real coefficients if there's a complex root the conjugate of that complex number must be another root so you can see why that if we have a third root it can't be a complex number for example if instead of 3 halves we had say 4 plus 5i well because the coefficients are real we'd have to have yet another root 4 minus 5i so in that case we'd have 4 roots but that doesn't happen for cubic equations for cubic equations we can have only at most 3 roots we can't have 4 roots so you can see why the third one must be real here is the graph of f of z now we normally refer to the horizontal axis as the x-axis but because the independent variable is z here we call this horizontal axis the z-axis the graph only cuts the z-axis at one point because there's only one real root and that's three halves or 1.5 um, now if we zoom out we see that this cubic is an unusual looking cubic because we don't have any turning points so that can happen for a cubic function it's certainly not a straight line but it doesn't have any turning points w is z1 multiplied by z1 bar so z1 is 1 minus 2y z1 bar is, is its conjugate we saw the multiplication of these two numbers before I have have them the other way around actually here I have z1 bar by z1 but the order of multiplication does not matter of course um, when we multiply a complex number by its conjugate we get the square of the magnitude of the complex number okay so as a reminder if we take any complex number say z1 and multiply by z1 bar we get the square of the magnitude okay so um, the magnitude of 1 plus 2i is the square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared and we just have to square this grand of course you could just do the multiplication in the usual way and the i terms will cancel out so here is 1 minus 2i on the argand diagram so it's equivalent to plotting the point with coordinates 1 minus 2 its conjugate is got by reflecting this point through the real axis so we get the point with coordinates 1 comma 2 w is a real number it's 5 or if you like 5 plus 0i so it's the point with coordinates 5 comma 0 okay next we're going to get this acute angle z1 bar w z1 so z1 bar w is one arm and w z1 is the other arm the easiest way to do this is to calculate this angle a here so we're in a right angle triangle of course so the side opposite a is two units long the side adjacent to a is four units long the tan of a is two over four so a is inverse tan of 
2 over 4 or inverse tan of a half. Now by symmetry, this angle down here also has size A. Okay, this distance is also 2 down here. So we multiply 2 by inverse tan a half, and rounding to the nearest degree we get 53 degrees. Here we have two complex numbers. The complex number on top is 4, or if you like, 4 plus 0i, and the complex number underneath is 1 plus root 3i, so we have one complex number over another complex number. And we want to write it as the single complex number, 1 minus root 3i. So we know what to do here. You multiply above and below by the conjugate of the denominator. The conjugate of 1 plus root 3i is 1 minus root 3i. When we multiply the denominators together we get a real number, which is actually the square of the magnitude of this complex number. Okay, it's just the same as 1 squared plus root 3 squared, which is 1 plus 3, it's 4. And we just divide each term on top by 4. So now we've written these two complex numbers, 4 over 1 plus root 3i as a single complex number. The other way to uh, prove this is to simply assume that it's true. Assume that 4 over 1 plus root 3i is equal to 1 minus root 3i and see what the consequences are. Well, to get this equation into a straight line, we multiply both sides by 1 plus root 3i to kill this denominator on the left-hand side. Um, now, if you multiply out the right-hand side, we're multiplying a complex number by its conjugate. So that's going to be just the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared, which is indeed 4. So we see that this is true, so if we reverse this step, we find that this must be true. Now here we have z plotted on this argon diagram. The real part is 1, the imaginary part is minus root 3. We can't pin down root 3 exactly because root 3 is an irrational number. It cannot be written as the ratio of two integers, a and b. So we can only get an approximate form for root 3. So say to two decimal places it's 1.73 so roughly speaking we have to go down to uh, minus 1.73 on our imaginary axis. So as we've seen before to get a complex number in Cartesian form converted to polar form we need to find out r and theta. r is the distance of the complex number to the origin also known as the modulus or magnitude of the complex number Theta is measured anti-clockwise from the positive real axis. So that's the usual convention for measuring angles in trigonometry. Positive angles are measured anti-clockwise from the positive x-axis. Okay, so let's get theta. Well, to do that we just get this acute angle in here, of course. Um, if we construct this right angle, tri uh, right angle triangle, the side opposite A is root 3 side adjacent A is 1. Okay, so we get that A is 60 degrees, so to get theta we obviously take 360 and subtract 60 to get 300 degrees. In radians that's 5 pi over 3 radians, so you can put in rads for short if you like. Usually it's left out. Now, we know how to get R, we just use Pythagoras. R is the square root of the sum of the squares of the two short sides. So we have um, 1 minus root 3i in polar form. Of course, if you want to check this, just multiply 2 by cos 300. You should get 1. And 2 times sine 300 should be minus root 3. Next, we have a simple application of de Mauver's theorem. We just want to take 1 minus root 3i and raise it to the power of 10. So we've done this many times before. Um, so rather than using raising the Cartesian form to the power of 10, we take the polar form and raise it to the power of 10. So we have a product in here, of course. The product is raised to the power of 10, so each factor is put to the power of 10. So we have 2 to the power of 10 times what's left to the, to the power of 10. And we s now we can apply the most theorem, because um, if we raise what's in the square brackets to the power of 10, we just get cos of 10 times 300. 3,000, plus i times the sine of 10 times 300. So we just multiply the power by the angle. So that's the Mauver's theorem, which is not obvious, of course. Okay, if you go to your calculator, the cos of 3,000 is minus 0.5. The sine of 3,000, you will find... Um, 
Well, to three decimal places, it's 0.866, so you might recognize that 0.866, etc., is root 3 over 2. Um, if you don't recognize that fact, you could take 3000 and divide by 360. It's the um, degrees in a full circle, of course. So you'll see that we have eight revolutions with 120 degrees left over. So you could say that 3000 degrees is equivalent to 120 degrees. You might then consider what the uh, um, sine of 120 degrees is. So sine 3000 is the same as the sine of 120. You see that 120 is in this quadrant here of the units circle. Um, so you see that the, the y value of this point, that is sine 120, is the same as the y value of this point over here, which is the sine of 60. Okay, if you just project across um, you'll see that this angle here is 60. And, you know, that's one of the special angles. So if you look that up, you'll see that sine of 60 is root 3 over 2. So that's the same as sine 120, which in turn is the same as sine 3000. So if you see that sine 3, uh, 0.866 um, is root 3 over 2, we can do some simplifying here. See, we can uh, take out this factor of a half, so we've 2 to the 10 divided by 2 is 2 to the 9, and we can write our answer like this.